Hello and welcome to the Must Talk Podcast. This is Connor O'Boyle. Okay, I'm here in LA and this is the first of a few podcasts that I have scheduled for this LA trip. And I'll let you know more about those as the details come. So, today I'm speaking with Evan Goldman. Evan is a composer and producer based in LA and has scored numerous films such as Martyrs and most recently A Violent Separation. In addition to his skills in composition, Evan is an expert in mock-up production and hybrid scores, so we get into all that. So, without further delay, I give you Evan Goldman. Okay, so I'm here in LA with Evan Goldman at his beautiful studio down in Venice Beach. It's great to be here, Evan. How are you? Good, good, yeah. Um, I just got off working in really... Um, tiring projects so i'm kind of in that funny composer state where you're um uh, you're sort of calm after the storm and mm. then but there's like still other things on the horizon so right. you gotta sort of keep on your toes but right. it's nice i'm i'm enjoying a little bit of free time off uh, mm-hmm. at the moment so mm-hmm. yeah. the weather's good and yeah weather's good <laughs> so tell me uh what do you do? Can you describe your what, what you do as a as a job? Sure. Um, well, my main job is full time writing original music for film, television, commercials, and trailers. Um, I have a particular knack and passion for the more orchestral side of things. Um, that's not to say I don't do electronic music as well. Um, and I really enjoy that kind of challenge, but I think my, my own, I think it's important everyone, right. Be pretty aware of their own strengths and weaknesses. Mm -hmm. And I know my greatest strength is more kind of your Silvestri, John Williams, Jerry Goldsmith Mm -hmm. type stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and I've tried to do my best over the years um, to sort of cultivate that strength and, and in particular develop my own sort of um, methods for crafting my demos and my mock-ups, um, particularly my orchestral ones, to be as realistic as possible. Yeah, and that's what we're going to talk about today, mostly. Yeah. Uh, we're going to talk about some other things as well, but we kind of want to focus in on those techniques and those practices uh that you've developed over the years to get your mock-up sound in as, as well as they do so, that sounds good so can you uh give us a little background where are you from sure uh i grew up in uh, washington dc i'm way on the other side of the country um and was always interested in music but i never um, and I, as a little kid, you know, I'd go to the piano and play little things I heard in my head and I always had a sort of good ear for music. Um, I took piano lessons. I was never a good sight. Uh, to this day, I'm kind of a bad sight reader. Yeah, me too. I can read a score fine. I just can't sight read it. I certainly can't sit down and read, sight read a piano chart. Um, mm-hmm. and I think early on that discouraged me actually for music, but I was fortunate enough to have, um, uh, both parents that were really, they didn't sort of force me into it, but any um, kind of time they saw me gravitating towards this or that musical thing, they did everything they could to encourage it and support mm-hmm. it. Were your parents um, musical? Did, was there music in the house growing up? My mom took piano lessons when she was young, um, but was never... Um, really serious about it my dad um i think he really appreciates music and and his father actually was a really fantastic like jazz pianist not in any notable way but he played he made his living like playing Mm -hmm. um early on in his youth by like playing clubs in chicago Mm -hmm. um and uh he um my dad likes to joke that the his father had a great ear, and he likes to joke that it skipped his skipped generation, generation to yeah. me. Um, I think that's like twins, right? <laughs> yeah, something like that. But um, they, uh, yeah, they were always really encouraging. And then I, I was fortunate too to have like piano teachers that um, 
were didn't sort of force me in one direction or the other and were also very kind of um I don't know what the word is encouraging and forgiving to my um interests which were more you know less doing scales and learning Mozart and more kind of actually learning like cool little John Williams tunes or mm-hmm. learning um, how to play 12 bar blues patterns okay. and stuff like that. Um, but all that is to say for a long time, I never even remotely considered the possibility of pursuing music professionally until um, when I was 16 years old, I was, I had just got my license and I was sort of looking for something fun to do with my summer um and your license your, your driver's, driver's license, driver's yes, license yeah. right. okay. um and uh yeah i was looking for something fun to do in my summer my older brother who was six years ahead of me um he when he was 16 and i was 10 he had spent a summer interning out in california um doing very political stuff which is his passion mm-hmm. and i loved that idea i love the idea of a 16 year old like getting a girl go across the country in cool beach town LA and and um especially growing up in DC which is an amazing city but it could not be more different than LA um I love the idea of coming out here and the sort of joke of it that I always tell is like basically what happened was my um father was talking with a really close family friend who lived in Santa Barbara and knew a lot of the musical people around Santa Barbara and and one day on the phone, this phone conversation that changed my life, the family friend said to my dad, well, you know, there's this film composer in my neighborhood who takes on students. Um, would Evan be interested? I, I know Evan wants to come out to California, but he can't figure out what to do. Mm-hmm. Um, would he maybe be interested in coming out and living with me? He can stay in my extra room for two weeks, three weeks, and maybe this guy will, will take him on as a student. And I jumped at the chance. Um... That that man was Richard Bellis, who many people know run, runs the ASCAP workshop. Um, and I think what's really sort of funny and ironic and wonderful, actually, in retrospect, too, is that I think for both Richard and myself, we just saw it as nothing that special. Like, I, 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 you, you'd have to ask Richard, but I think for Richard, not knowing, it was just like, oh, nice, another yeah. paycheck, you know, another private student. And I think for me, it was an excuse to get out of DC for the summer. But the, the irony of it all was that, um, that two weeks just like completely opened my world to what film scoring was. Mm-hmm. And I was, had he written the Ed score at that point? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So this, he, was, this was this was a little ways out. Cause this would have been, this was the summer of 2004. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, so 14 years ago. Wow. Mm-hmm. He, uh, um, but yeah, I, I came out here and I just, I lived with my friend and I got to enjoy beautiful Santa Barbara for two or three weeks and, and just twice, two or three times a week I went over to his house Mm -hmm. and, um, and I, you know, I learned, I got a crash course. I learned what spotting was and I learned what, um, a sequencer was actually, he was the first person to introduce me to a sequencer. It was digital performer four, I think three or four even i don't know i think it was Mm -hmm. four and uh but but at the end of it all um he was kind enough too and um and big shout out as well to jen Harmon and mike todd um who agreed to this but they basically let me as like this 16 year old kid tag along as a fly on the wall to a bunch of the 2004 ascap workshop events so I got to sit in the back corner when Randy Newman came in to give a talk mm-hmm. to the panel, and I got to um, uh, go to the, the the session at the end of the whole thing, which uh, was the first time ever I had set foot on a studio lot, let alone the famed Newman scoring stage, let alone seen the just unbelievable um, Los Angeles musicians play. And, like, that night, I just was hooked. Like, I knew this is what I wanted to do yeah. with the rest of my life. Um, and, and I, I like, it, and I really can't speak to the significance of that night enough. I, I actually went and I wrote, a, a year, two years later, I wrote all my, like, college entrance essays, application essays mm-hmm. about that night. Because I was applying to music schools at that point. 
Um, and yeah, that's how I got started. And then I okay. came back every summer. After that, I studied more with Richard. I, I interned at one point at um, Remote Control. Mm-hmm. Nothing special. I was just grabbing coffee and dry cleaning. For um, anybody that doesn't know, Remote Control is Hans Zimmer's place, right? Yes, yes. But it's it's uh, it's Hans Zimmer's place, but it's really more of a sort of collective campus yeah. with I don't know how many people are there now. Right. There's a lot of a lot of really great people there now. Um, yeah, and so tell me then, you're uh, you're applying to university, or or was it like more of a conservatoire based? uh education so i i grew up um the son of two uh americans will understand this but the michigan wolverines they're um it's a really big school in michigan and there's a lot of uh school spirit Mm -hmm. there um especially related around sports and whatnot but i i as the son of two people like that i grew up really um sort of in love with the community aspect that that brings people mm-hmm. um like fond memories of going to rose bowl games with my dad to see michigan play or um what do they not. have so do do they have the uh those halftime shows with the with the drum yeah, yeah, yeah. The marching band yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything in march- so yes that's, that's a really good training uh, sure musically if you, sure. If you come from that background um, as well yeah absolutely i but i for me it was just the sort of joy and camaraderie that like big division one sports brings Mm -hmm. and i'm not by any means like a jock or anything i played i played tennis but um uh it was more just about the sort of sense of community and camaraderie even going to like you know funny like if you go to a school like michigan um that sort of camaraderie stays with you forever Mm -hmm. and people will wear you know hats and my dad would be we'd be in china like on a family trip in china and there'd be a guy walking down the mm-hmm. plaza or the Great Wall wearing a Michigan hat, and he'd say, go blue to him. And it's right. like you're on the side of the side of the world. And that kind of thing was very cool to me. So that's a long way of saying, because of that, I, I never really had an interest in smaller um, conservatory schools. Mm-hmm. So my focus was finding schools that were, were big schools with a lot of different majors and a lot of different studies um that had really good music programs within them Mm. um and my top places ended up being um michigan usc and miami which are three examples of exactly that um michigan ended up just i i just couldn't deal with the cold i grew up in dc and i wanted a change of pace um and uh usc was awesome um it was a really cool school I, funny enough, I got into USC and I did not get into their music program. Um, And I thought about going as a general major, but I knew I was really passionate about music. And then at the same time, too, even if I had gotten in, I may have picked Miami anyway, because I really loved Miami and I I went there and I don't regret it at all. It was Mm -hmm. just an amazing program. And what's really cool, too, is seeing um, how far, even just in the last couple of years, that program has gone. Um, especially as it relates to film scoring in terms yeah. of the people they've brought in there and and they've got, you know, fellowships and residents with like James Newton Howard now and Shelley Berg took over the program and it's cool. Like Rick Todd started teaching French the French horn studio there. And for those of you that don't know, like Rick Todd was one of the main French horn studio musicians of Los Angeles for mm-hmm. a long time. So right. the fact that Miami got him to come there and teach their French horn players is mm-hmm. is always struck me as really cool. Right. And coming from a from a, a European um education system and how the these kind of film scoring programs are sort of emerging in Europe now you've got like Berkeley in Valencia yeah. and you've got, you know, these kind of places. And obviously they're they're modeled on the American system. So can you kinda very briefly just run through the the kind of education that you were exposed to was it mainly kind of so it's interesting i i might be the wrong person to ask this because i have a very kind of unique experience okay um my uh time out here from a very young age before i was even applying to college with Mm -hmm. richard um and in turn the subsequent summers where i i studied with richard and i interned at, at um remote and um and really sort of came out here 
every summer immersing myself in the the real stuff out here mm-hmm. it it created a funny situation where when I got to college and I, I applied to the and got in and I had started out at Miami as in their what they called media writing and production major which is like their sort of combination of film scoring and it was also like pop production right um and and what happened was is I sort of quickly discovered that for me at least and this is I'm sure not the case for everyone. It was better to spend my time um, learning, uh, like, the nitty-gritty of film scoring out here, Mm. uh, interning, assisting film composers out here, because it's changing every day, and it's not, I don't want, I'm not trying to knock Miami's program or anything like that, or Berkeley's program or anything like that. I think it's great to learn the basics of what, you know, sample libraries are and sequencers are and how to put it all together and routing and all these things are like really instrumental and and it's great to find a program that can give you those those things. But the actual sort of like nuances and difficulties of being an everyday professional successful film composer are so complicated and... um, also so um constantly evolving Mm -hmm. that i i don't necessarily believe any academic program can give you all of that yeah um i mean it's so uh well so all this is to say though that my sophomore year at miami halfway through the year i changed majors actually um from the media writing production to just the regular um theory composition and I decided pretty quickly that I would devote my entire time at Miami to just like learning how to become a better composer. Right. Um, and and yeah, it was a great uh, for me. It was a great decision. Now I also had the benefit though of having like the Richard Bellis and mm. the internship at Remote and the sort of experiences that could teach me about where yeah. to go next once I graduated. So you've got the practical um, and the and the theoretical kind of yeah. the two sides of the coin. Yeah. There. So that that may not be the right move for someone else. Um because you know there's a lot sure there's a lot of people too I think who um graduate with just your standard theory composition mm-hmm. um background and and learn, you know, all that kind of avant garde um uh, 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 what, concert music sort of writing mm-hmm. and then they decide that they really want to become film composers but they don't really know where to start and right. that is where I think those pro- like Berkeley programs and USC programs are really amazing because mm-hmm. they, they give you a place to start they take those people who are fundamentally good composers and they expose them to all the sort of um, uh, foundational aspects of where to start. I mean, you meet guys like Conrad Pope, and you mm-hmm. meet guys like um, uh, Bruce Broughton, and mm-hmm. and all sorts of really amazing people in this industry that can give you your first kind of inroads yeah. and getting your feet wet, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think it's also the the difference between universities and the the real stuff in LA is the idea of actually making music. Like in terms of actually producing sound, uh, in terms of the schooling, it's more kind of notes on a page that are never really brought to life. It's it's got this sort of analytical feel to it, where you're kind of more analyzing the processes and the underlying techniques. Yeah. But you never really hear them unless you're listening to a record. Like, but I mean, if you're doing a composing, uh, you know, a major in composing. Most of the time, you're just going to be presenting scores, uh, it, it, especially if they're orchestrated. I mean, if you've got, if you got a piano reduction, you might be able to have a pianist perform it, or you you might be able to get a string quartet together to play some something. But in terms of actually going to those sessions and hearing those musicians perform, it's it's an education in itself, and you know, yeah. getting collecting your scores back from the performers at the end of the session and seeing their notes that they've written on the page and if a violinist has, for example, changed the bowing instructions or, you know, what they've done in terms of phrasing and those Absolutely. those subtle nuances are, are super important and you don't learn those in a school unless you are a performer. No, you don't. And and what's so interesting too is, yeah, I mean, as I reflect on my time at Miami as just um, a regular composition major, I mean, not once was I ever 
for assignments asked to hand in a mock-up. Mm-hmm. You know, it was all doing my, handing in my, my scores, mm-hmm. my sheet music. Um, and I'm, I'm not one of those people that can do that without doing the mock-up first. Right. Like, I, I, can, I know how to orchestrate and I know how to certainly use Sibelius and create my own full scores, but I have to do it in a sequencer first. Mm. Um, I wouldn't be able to sit down with a piece of manuscript paper and do it with a pencil, pencil and paper. Um, and uh, But that's the thing, too, is that I was fortunate enough, again, from the age of 16, to be taught what you know Digital Performer 4 was at the mm. time. And so all through college, I was all my assignments, everything, I was doing it all in Digital Performer. I think it was five then. Mm. Um, and, uh, and that's sort of how I evolved, but, um, it is certainly interesting that, and your point about Boeing and and things like that too is, is equally as important and fascinating because, and unfortunately I can't say what, but I, I just came out of watching, um, like one of just the A-list composers in town do a week of sessions, um, uh, on a, like a blockbuster movie and just, I mean, the amount I learned just watching him run these sessions, watching him give instructions to, um, the concert master to try different Boeings here and there Mm -hmm. and different things is like, so my brain hurt by the end of it. Like I, um, and it's so much more, um, I don't know how to put it. It sticks with you, right. I think, better than sitting in a classroom. Oh, it um, does, you know, 100%. I mean, experiences, um, you know, um, experiences are always more engaging, more you remember something that, that happened to you. I, I remember Conrad saying, you know, when I tell you something, when I tell you not to blend, you know, a French horn with a with a... a chimbasso or something just solo on their own mm-hmm. you know it's like i'm telling you that because i did it yeah and because yeah. it sounded crap exactly. you know what i mean it's, it's like yes. I, i'm not telling you because uh you know walter piston wrote it in a book or something or schoenberg yes. wrote it in a book exactly i'm telling you because i was in the room and it sucked <laughs> yes yeah <laughs> that and that that is like the epitome of what happened to me last week like s- there was just so much of that watching sitting at the the stage watching this this a-lister with this 85 piece orchestra mm-hmm. do take after take trying different things because he wasn't getting quite the sound that he wanted and there's other things that struck me too is like looking at the scores as I'm watching this and seeing directions that were oh what was it it was something the orchestra had put in the directions to the strings something that was um i wish i could remember what it was it was something incredibly like to the point and Mm. oh i remember what it was it was it was a it was sort of a rhythmic figure for strings but it was sort of evolved out of a more um rock mentality right and the orchestrator put in the score is like play this like it's a like it's set on bolt like with a rock mm-hmm. feeling. Right. And sort of right away the the players actually got it. Yeah. And that's the thing too, is like you can't like if you're if you're studying concert composition or you're reading in a book, like you, you you'll never get that. Like you'll never get that. It's learning the shorthand with the LA studio yeah. musicians to get what you want and learning, like you said, if you combine it maybe sounds good in a theory, but if you combine this or that instrument at this stage mm-hmm. with that group, it's gonna sound horrible. Like yeah. it's not gonna sound what you want. And it's sadly the only way to, to learn that stuff is to really kind of go through it yourself. Yeah, make the mistakes, yeah. I mean I've had similar experiences in terms of being in the session. Uh and I, I was writing a a tango and the players were all from a classical background and uh there's a there's a technique in in tango and string playing called a chop i don't i don't think it's exclusive to tango but it's got that sort of latin feel and it's where the where the violinists will play like it'll be like you know, playing a guitar where you play the dead strings uh you mute the strings with your hand and you, you play it almost percussively and it's 
creates this sort of like if you don't have a snare drum you know you see that people like Ed Sheeran and things they'll they'll kind of play the guitar so that it provides sort of like a like a pulse or a, a beat to it and uh, I had notated and I'd done all the research and I'd looked at kind of tango scores and um, and it was on the day and I thought I had everything written down perfectly and like you know the, the, the players are going to have no questions and mm-hmm. it's just it's it's absolutely immaculately done and you know the the sheet music goes on the stand and first thing the, the violinist's hands are up in this I'm sorry what is that and <laughs> I'm spending two or three minutes explaining to it and, and I'm getting you know people are tapping their watches saying oh, you know Connor we're, we're on a time schedule here you know right. and you know to this day I mean that that has such a profound effect and I mean um because the musicians don't see the music beforehand, they don't practice it. They right. don't. It's just on the day. I mean, and that that is the clinical nature of yeah. of of film scoring that is not analogous across the across in, into concert music, where the orchestras all practice for maybe yeah. weeks before, and they're they're playing music that that's extremely well known, and right. and all of the techniques and things are are you know essentially just in their head from yeah. from from childhood um, you can get away with crazy tempo shifts yeah and everyone's staying together you can get away with you know really wild multi-metered mm. phrases and things like that mm-hmm. um if you're trying to do that with a film score date though it's like no you gotta know what you're doing <laughs> and i mean and i mean like that's that's and that's where the mock-ups come in and the mock-ups allow you to preempt any of those any of those problems that you might have like uh strange combinations of instruments or uh, instruments that don't quite blend together because one is too piercing and too bright yeah. you know like combining a solo piccolo with a solo double bass it's like all right that's going to have a very 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 particular and significant sound yeah and is it the sound that i want uh probably not if there's dialogue <laughs> definitely not if there's dialogue it would be interesting if it was like a horror scene, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they, you could, you could, you could definitely have them and <laughs> and use them in a particular way. But I mean, allowing yourself that opportunity to to get that right in advance is yes. is is the purpose of the mock up. True. It's also to like uh, help the director feel more comfortable in in allowing you to take it to the live musicians. For sure. So can, the can, thing about mock ups, and this was. And I and I, I consider myself to be pretty good at this, but like even I still have my moments where I'm like I, I what's the word I'm looking for? Where it's just like a um one of those moments where you just do something kind of dumb and you just like learn your lesson, you're just like lesson learned. Mm. You know, I still have those all the time and the thing about mock ups is they allow you to cheat. Mm-hmm. They like allow you, they can allow you to get away with things that that the moment you go into the real world you're exposed that you you can't get away with anymore. So mm-hmm. and that's when you learn like you learn um I remember the very first time ever that I I um wrote a piece at, at Miami at the end of every semester they um would do uh, on like the literal last day of orchestra rehearsal, um, the school's orchestra would do um, readings of composer majors pieces, just quick readings. And I had just gotten like a really kick-ass sample library for the first time in my whole life. Mm. And I wrote this sort of sort of slightly Mars bringer of war-esque type piece, two minute piece. But I, like, had a cello ostinato that did not stop. Like, it was, like, eighths without any break for, like, two and a half minutes. And it's, I was like, because it sounds cool in the samples. And, like, we gave it to the to the um, orchestra, and it was just a disaster. And I just got some really mean looks, too. Um, I remember from this one cellist, who's great. She was awesome. Um and and we became friends later uh so it was all good but yeah i just got me looks from her and i just remember like lesson learned like mm-hmm. don't write a cello ostinato um certainly not for a college orchestra without any breaks at all yeah. um 
and uh, and yeah, it's it's that's the thing. It's like learning those lessons. Um, and yeah. one of those, I I I won't go into detail, but it, I had another one of those lessons just last week with it's at this other project and um, with the sailors composer and um, and it was just so eye opening. Mm. Um, I mean, that that's that's a distinction that I think is important. I suppose the difference between uh, what you're looking to achieve with your music in terms of how you want the listener or the audience to perceive that music. So, for example, like let's just take Hans. Yeah. Um, Hans is style for for uh, versus John Williams style. For example, John is firmly in what can be played by a human being. It's yeah. very 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 unlikely that you're going to hear a John Williams score that you yourself with uh, given a certain amount of time you could not play. Right. Um, He's got some pretty. Pretty difficult scores, but, yeah, but yes. But, but I mean, yes, like, I mean, if, I know you, what you're if, saying. if you yes. had if you had enough time, it's absolutely right. And you, you had enough patience, you could. Play. Any professional orchestra, any professional orchestra could play John yeah. Williams. Yeah. in because he because he writes he writes with, with enough the, practice. because yeah, he yes. writes with the specific, the specific yeah. idea that a human being can play this right. That's right. Where, on the other school, you have you've Hans and. He would very much be interested in in creating sonorities and and sounds that possibly cannot be reproduced um, by a, st- a session orchestra or a, a session player. I mean, well, I think the thing that, and I think this makes frankly Hans so brilliant, um, is he he sort of I think to an extent, right? He throws the rules Mm -hmm. out the window. Exactly, exactly, yes. But he he thinks of an orchestra, or at least the way I say, I'm not, I'm just sort of supposing here. I'm not, I don't have any insight, personal insight into how Hans thinks. But to me, it seems like he thinks of an orchestra and an orchestra session is just a sort of another tool for his sequencer, for the overall final sound, which can be made up of multiple takes and pick up passages and loopings yeah. and different I mean, groups of combining different sample sessions. I mean, we were, when I was at, um, I was fortunate to see an in inception, uh, through the SCL, mm. which for anyone that doesn't know too, that's another quick shout out to them. That's yeah. a really fantastic organization, um, it, here in Los Angeles. Um, I think New York as well. Society of Composers and Lyricists. That's right. Um, One of the first things I did when I I moved out here was become a member. um, And I recently just like upped my membership to the next level because they're just great. But they they do um, sort of industry events for their members. And their their best thing, which really pays for itself, is they do free movie screenings. Mm -hmm. um, And sometimes TV as well. uh, where they'll bring in like the composer that scored the movie and i was fortunate enough to actually to see inception uh a week early before it even came out in theaters and hans came in and did a q a with everyone and what he said was if remembering it right i think he said something like he was at the premiere the london premiere of um sherlock holmes when he ran into Chris Nolan, uh, I guess at the London premiere. And that's when Chris started telling him about what he was up to on inception. And, and, um, and sort of, they told him about the sort of Edith Piaf thing and the slowing down thing and the sort of Mm -hmm. cool, big bomb sort of ideas and things. And like, I think Han said, I apologize if I don't remember this exactly, but I think he said he like booked a session at Abbey Road the next day with 40 brass players. <laughs> just like nothing written. And it was just to like, and when you're Hans and you're working on a Chris Nolan film, you can do this. Mm-hmm. But I think it also shows a kind of um, geniusness in terms of how to utilize an orchestra in a completely yeah. different way than John Williams, where it's like, I'm just going to go into the Abbey Road with 40 brass players and we're going to record all sorts of really crazy, awesome stuff. Yeah. And and then he gave that to his guru, genius Mel Wesson, and 
from that was built this like amazing palette, right? Um, which was utilized when it came time to actually write the score. Yeah, and and so it's so right there is like this example of you know finding a new way to use an acoustic orchestra because exactly. it's not like he used samples; he used the orchestra, but he he did it in a way that was the complete opposite of John yeah. Williams, which was really, really brilliant. And I think everyone will agree, like, the Inception score is incredible. It's it's wonderful. I mean, Hans Hans definitely is is an innovator. There's no question about it. I mean, he was the first, well, not maybe the first one, but a, he was an early adopter of, of samples in general. And he is the probably the main person responsible for the the way that film scoring exists today but i mean just going back to that idea of where john williams would see the orchestra as the sum of all the pieces so the idea of like the orchestra being the total yeah hans would argue that the orchestra is a piece within the total yeah uh, made up of smaller that's pieces good, that's a very good way to sum it up yeah. you know what i mean and uh like I, i've heard stories and, and things of you know him using isolation in terms of like where where John would have the orchestra in the room all at the same time, Hans would say, no, 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 we're just doing strings, and then yeah. I'll have a clean take of the strings with no bleed. For sure. And then I can use those strings and blend them with the samples. There's and- all sorts of reasons to do that. Yeah. It's called striping. Okay. Um, and there's, yeah, it depends on the score, depends on what you want, but it, a big reason to do that is mixing. It allows mm-hmm. you to, to mix in different ways that you wouldn't be able to do if you had everyone in the room at the same time. Yeah, but I mean, it, it, it produces a, an entirely different sound. I mean, yeah. you lose the... Well, I suppose you can and fake it to a certain degree of the sound of the, the instruments in the room, but what you don't really get is that um, natural blend that the performers will instinctively right. look for. I mean, you know, they'll not the clarinets won't be listening to the, to the oboes or the... Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? In terms of, like... You, you you lose that, but I mean you can get that back in the mix. But the natural sound that comes with a with a performer is a, is a totally different sound world. And yeah, and uh, so this this kind of leads us into into this idea of of mock up. So uh, talk to me about how you uh, how you have evolved in terms of your approach to mock ups and and how you perceive them uh, as a as a technique. Sure, I mean I think well I think. The sort of first rule, the one that um, I think whether you're taking the John Williams approach or the Hans Zimmer approach, the one that is just sort of universal, um, overarching, is that your mock-up has to sound good. Yeah. Um, It has to sound good because if it doesn't, the director will fire you. (laughs) That's just the reality. Um, And... um, I mean, I, I guess John Williams is, uh, I think, from what I understand, he's pretty much the actual last person ever, like, in history that doesn't have to do mock-ups. Yeah, plays it on piano still. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, and and so, yeah, literally, unless you're John Williams, um, you, you've got to do a mock-up. You have to show the director what you're doing what what's what they're gonna get and it's gotta be convincing enough that they don't freak out and say oh why does this sound like that you know mm-hmm. um it, it, the sort of reality of our industry at this point has gotten to the place where you just can't get away anymore with saying like oh it'll sound great when we get to the mm-hmm. to the real mm-hmm. orchestra um so yeah whether you're writing john williams esque music or hans zimmer esque music or anything and everything outside or in between that the this it almost goes without saying but the there is just such a key importance to being able to do a good mock-up yeah um i think the next or the well okay the question that comes from that right is how do you do a good mock-up i don't pretend to be like a world expert or anything like that Um, I'll only sort of share as we go forward my own thoughts and tips and tricks from the years I've spent doing this, um, that I've developed for myself on how to achieve that, that end. Mm -hmm. Um, for me, it all starts with building a kind of, um, 
how you put it, a sort of subconscious internal glossary, like auditory glossary of what stuff should sound like yeah. if it were played by real musicians. And this applies to both, like, how should, like, if you're, if you're sitting in your sequencer and you're doing something, you want to, you want to be able to answer the question, if I were to, if, if I'm writing a John Williams type piece and I give this to London Symphony at Abbey Road Air Studios or whatever, how would this really sound? Mm -hmm. You want to be able to like answer that question before you even set out to mock it up because that's how you can mock it up to make it sound good. Um, this also applies though to um, the sort of Han Williams or Han Williams Han Zimmer approach as well in the, it, albeit in a different question but it's like if I'm gonna do a 40 piece brass session in London, that I can then chop up and utilize in mm -hmm. a really weird, different way. How would that sound? Mm -hmm. um, so it all still relates to that sort of overarching number one golden rule, which is um, how would this sound if I gave it to real people? And and the only way to know that is to... Um, it's a combination of things. So obviously, yeah, working with live musicians, but like most of us can't afford to go hire a 40 piece brass orchestra just to experiment um so for me the the biggest learning experience i had um as i first sort of started doing it all was actually attempting to mock up pre-existing things mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um it's it's also fun too it's it's for me it's fun um but like if you if i were ever to teach a course on this my first assignment would be everyone go find a master recording that you love of something orchestral and then go try to mock it up and ideally have the sheet music and the score in front of you too mm -hmm. because in doing that you you will be surprised about how much you learn i i learned so much and it's all about knowing like, uh, like for example, I'll give when I was doing this was um, I grew up totally obsessed with the John Williams Superman score, and so the very first time I got um, a really good sample library in college, I attempted to do a mock up of um, just the Superman March theme and just the opening. I don't know. Um, 15 seconds or so just with the ostinato um and i remember at the time i sort of thought like all i was hearing from the recording was just celli just mm -hmm. playing the famous ostinato which i won't sing for copyright reasons um but as i looked at the score and as i attempted to mock it up i realized oh no okay so it's celli playing the ostinato and bass playing not all of the ostinato, just the key beats, because if we played all the notes of the ostinato, it would muddy it up. It's viola playing it with it, and it's bassoon and bass clarinet playing with it, and timpani again with the bass playing just the key beats. And then, oh, at bar 10, the trombones split into this really wild sus harmony on the ostinato, mm -hmm. and and um, the clarinets join. And, and it's it's... So first off, learning that stuff, learning about orchestration and about how to, uh, which combinations of instruments create that sound, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's like so incredibly important. Yeah, but I mean, also, yeah, go ahead. I mean, m marking up is you're you're essentially sc score an analyzing score at the same time. Right. Um, it's 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 a it's a two birds with one stone type For sure. exercise. I mean, you are actually. You're you're de delving into the the actual sound world of the instruments and how to recreate them digitally, and and that is a very worthwhile endeavor. But at the same time, you're you're exercising the orchestration muscle as well. I mean, we we did a uh, ET, and one of the things I learned is anytime the cello have a long melody line in Williams, it's 
almost always accompanied by horns. Yeah. Because they blend so well together and they, they give you that, that sonorous singing uh, theme that, that we all love. And, um, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a, a completely legitimate tool. Um, if you are not really or don't have the patience or the, the time to sit at a table with a, with a score and right. go, uh, okay, so there, the, the that line's doubled there. And I mean, mocking it up is a more interactive and more fun way of actually achieving the same For result. For sure. For sure. I mean, you can write, in a mock-up, you can do a horn melody, mm-hmm. a big horn melody, and you can sort of think to yourself, why doesn't this sound as good as John Williams or Jerry mm-hmm. Goldsmith or whatever? And the reason is because you haven't added Chelly to it. Mm-hmm. Um uh, yeah, and it, and it's. I remember too. I learning that there is a a really beautiful passage in um, Air Force One, Jerry Goldsmith Air Force mm-hmm. One, where he just at the end, the end titles like he launches into the, his main theme, and it's just sort of shimmering violins up top, uh, giving you the harmony, and then just this stunning two D horn line. And you think, like, why does that sound so beautiful? And if you look at the score and you really listen, you realize it's because it's not just horns, it's horns and celli mm-hmm. together. Mm-hmm. And so that combination, you, you realize, like, light bulb moment, yeah. that's how you achieve that sound. And, and in turn, when you then go to do your own mock-up for your own writing, and you write a horn line... And you have that knowledge, like, oh, wait, this is one of those really lyrical, beautiful horn lines. I should add celli to this. And then you mock it up with the celli as well. And sure enough, your mock-up just got 10% better. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's all of those little lessons that make a mock-up go from bad or decent to, like, this sounds like a real orchestra. Mm -hmm. Um, It's learning those orchestration tricks. Basically, if you you approach doing a mock-up... Like Conrad Pope approaches doing a John Williams orchestration, that's how you that's how you get it there. But you have to know all those tricks, and and the best way to learn them, in my experience, is to find scores that you love and study them. I'm still mm-hmm. doing that like mm-hmm. all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, we, we I think it's I think it's a good idea at this point to define some terminologies here. Sure. Um, talk to me about the current industry thinking uh, when you are discussing orchestration and synthestration. Those two terms I hear quite frequently and the people that are orchestrators uh, tend to not associate themselves with people who would say, I don't know if it's a term, but a synthestrator. Yeah. um, Someone that deals exclusively in digital can you can you kind of sure. talk to that a little bit? Yeah, I think they are closely related. They um, are. They're very very closely related. But, and I do actually again I can't go into detail, but I actually I do have some very recent um, good experience with this, uh, where I think if you're synthestrating, what that really means is you're taking like a either a piano sketch that you or someone else did or a basic theme or concept or whatever it is, right? And you're, you're orchestrating it digitally. Mm-hmm. You're, you are spreading it out across all of the best instruments possible. You, you're attempting to think like a Conrad Pope or a Bill Ross or, mm-hmm. um, a, a, and, but in digital land and sequencer land, um, and I'd say the more you can do that, the better, because certainly it'll make your mock-up sound better. Mm-hmm. I think it also is very, when it comes time then to give it to an orchestrator, you're very clear about what you want. Right. Um, and orchestrators really like that, unless what you want is something that's completely terrible that they know for sure is going to sound horrible when you get to a stage. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's where I think being a synthestrator with a bit of humility is also really important too because you may be a really good synthestrator, but if you're talking to someone who has spent a decade or more taking even the best mock-ups and the best 
orchestrate synthestrated mock-ups and turning it into sheet music and watching it being played on a mm-hmm. stage like it pays to get their opinion too mm-hmm. um i cannot tell you the number of times recently that i i had an unbelievably detailed complex very difficult fully synthestrated out mock-up and i was i was fortunate enough to be working with um one of the industry's best orchestrators and I can't tell you the number of times I just called them up. I was like, will this work? Will this sound good? You know, is that right? What do you think about this? Um, because the thing about really good orchestrators, too, is that I think they're an asset to even the best synthestrators precisely because they're not synthestrators, mm-hmm. because their focus is finding a way to translate your synthestration into what will sound right. really good on the stage. Yeah. They also know all the best nuances about how do you dovetail mm-hmm. these mm-hmm. woodwinds that you've written for 15 bars without a rest in a way where you won't lose power right. because too many people are dropping rest. out in the wrong place. Like, that's what amazing orchestrators do. I mean, synthestrators, uh, from from my own experience, tend to think in terms of sample libraries and what works best in terms of combinations of sample libraries. Um, you know, they'll, they'll say like, oh, okay, so um, the LA scoring strings blends really well with with the, um, think, you know, yeah, the Spitfire I, stuff. So I think I'm, what I'm, you're describing there, though, is more of, more in the realm of someone that's just very good at programming. Right. That really knows samples and is very good at programming. Mm-hmm. Synthestration, though, I think requires a really... Um, important deep knowledge of orchestration. Of course, yeah. But what what I'm getting at is, I mean, so say you're working on a, on a project that that is never going to get to a scoring stage, and it's like yeah. most most TV, right? Yeah, for example. sure. Um, and you're trying to convince the listener that it it is in fact real. it is in fact real. Yeah. So, I mean. When you're when you're quote unquote synthesizing yeah. there, I mean it's a very loose term. It's a very new term that yep. that hasn't really clearly been defined yet. And um, people, uh, you know, well, they apply it to many different situations and, and different things. But I mean, take uh, I mean he 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 his early work, I suppose. Um, what's his name? The Walking Dead dude. Uh, Bear McCreary. Bear McCreary, right? So you know you listen to his scores, and he. Is using a lot of techniques and a lot of things like, like ostinati and and things that go on for long periods of time that necessarily wouldn't be achievable in or or even another example might be uh, Junkie XL, mm-hmm. um, where he comes from a, an electronic background, so he's he's quite happy to apply electronic music techniques. You know, you might have a you might have an ostinato that goes on for the entire queue. Like right. your two minute cue, and an orchestrator would say, "Well, the uh, player can't play that," and he'll say, "Well, <laughs> I'm a synthestrator, and my synths can." <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, right. You have that. You have that sort of those different schools of thinking, um, where the orchestrator is dealing in the real world. The synthestrator is exclusively, or not exclusively, but largely dealing in in the digital world. Sure. Th- that would be my kind of thinking on the on those two kind of terminologies. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, I mean, you just highlighted too the importance of another importance of um, being very good at doing mockups and synthestration, mm-hmm. which is so much of what we do doesn't get to a stage. Yeah. Um, most TV, as you said, you don't get to record with a live orchestra, um, and so a fair amount of the time and literally all of the time as you're starting out in your young in career, um, your, your mock-up, your synthestration is your final product. Um, so it does have to be good. And, and yeah, there is a, it's interesting because as we talk about, you know, things like combining French horn and celli to get that extra rich sound or, um, you know, another one we didn't, mentioned but like along the same lines you were talking with that um you know i'll never forget looking at a sylvestri score for the first time studying this huge epic heroic french horn line and realizing that it's not just french horns it's french horns and one trumpet 
Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. and realizing, like, wow, there's a trumpet there. And um, and that's just it, is, is the trumpet, with just one trumpet against all those French horns, it's like you wouldn't realize it's there, but if it was gone, you'd miss it. Because right. it adds just that extra little bit of sort of 5% more hero. Right. It's also more it's also more it. defining. It, it'll it'll define the line a little yeah, bit more. Exactly. You know I mean? Exactly. And so but here's here's the thing is as we talk about that kind of stuff, which is very kind of um fundamental orchestrational things, um, you could have the exact same conversation, and this is what I think you're starting to get at, uh, as it relates to how you combine specific sample mm-hmm. libraries. Mm-hmm. Let's let's talk about libraries for a little bit. Sure. I mean, where where do you come down on libraries and and what what libraries so would it, you recommend? So Not it, recommend, but yeah, yeah. I mean, where yeah. would you go to? Well, so again, it all comes back to um, how do you get it to sound as real as mm-hmm. possible? Mm-hmm. Um, and in the same way that you say, okay, this French horn line will sound better if I throw one trumpet on it, because that's what I'm hearing in the recording from this movie that I love so much. Um, you can say the exact same thing, for example, as it relates to um, string shorts, mm-hmm. like violin shorts, for example. Um, uh, and this is where, again, start. So, so start with listening to a master where you hear violin shorts and you're like, that sounds amazing. Mm-hmm. That's what I want my passage and my cue to sound like. And and listen to like the subtlest nuances about the way it's mixed, where it's sitting in the room, how much reverb is on it, how much high end you're hearing, how much mm-hmm. mid range you're hearing, um, how biting the short is, right. like how crisp and short it is, uh, versus how big and rich and long it is, and. And it's all those little things that as you, and this again goes back to the point about if you were forced in your first homework assignment theoretically to mock up a master that you love, you'll pay attention to that. Mm -hmm. Like if you're trying to, for me, mocking up Superman, if you're trying to make it sound exactly like the master recording with the London Symphony, um, you're going to pay attention to, oh, you know, these spiccato samples i'm using are way too um long they don't Mm -hmm. sound biting enough they don't they're they also don't have enough presence in them right and that's when you go searching for other libraries um and that's when you build up an even more nuanced beside beyond the level of orchestration where you're, you're doing the classical thinking of combining instruments now you're moving into the even more nuanced but equally if not more important aspect of how do you get samples to sound like the real thing, like truly like the real thing? And and this is the funny mistake, too, that I think a lot of people make um, who are kind of just starting out, which is you think it can be easy to think if you buy like this really expensive, amazing sample library, you're set. Mm-hmm. But like I would take I would hire someone with mediocre samples that really knows how to use them and yeah. knows their strengths and knows what they should sound like on any given line that they're writing. I would take someone like that over someone who has the best sample library on earth that doesn't really know how to use them. Exactly. Um, I mean, because it, their mock-ups will always sound better. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's this idea going back to what you originally said of, of building in your, in your mind or even on your, on your, on your desktop, this yep. sort of folder of yeah. of sounds that you you go to so i i know in my mind what uh a short spiccato um with um you know soltasto yeah i i know in my mind what that sounds like and then in addition to that then you're you're attaching to that what you, your sample library yeah you know so you're 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 library of sounds in your mind or in your on your computer you know so if i'm going for um you know bernard herman's psycho oh yeah those those shrieking you know or um those those really 
the the opening overture to cycle the da da yeah da, da. those are really hard to to mock up yeah. by the way i Maybe. would not start with i've tried <laughs> actually i've tried a bunch of different sample libraries and i can't get it to sound yeah right. but i mean you're 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 associating or you're you're assigning to that a particular library or combination of libraries that gets you as close to that as possible yeah and then every time you're coming back to that you're, you've got that sort of stored and banked. And exactly. From there, you can you can experiment and, and change yeah. it up. I mean, you want to get to a place where it's second nature that you, as you write, as you pick your track and you write something, you know how it should sound. Mm -hmm. You know what velocity to put it at. You know what mod wheel to put it at. Mm -hmm. You know what volume to put it at. Because um, that's the other thing that's so great, right, about samples these days is that they're they're incredibly complex and they give yes. you the scripts that have, <clears throat> you know, the, the the player playing. You could have a short patch that has four different lengths of shorts depending on which velocity you hit or where you have your mod set, as well as all the different dynamic values. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And, um, I mean, that's another thing too, right, about that we're sort of jumping all around, but, like, it, it's just right of the, my head now as I'm thinking about how many times I've heard um, you know someone trying to do like a Williams-esque sort of your standard orchestral mock-up and um, the biggest most common mistake I always hear is when someone programs with a whole orchestra going they program woodwinds where the woodwinds are playing they've got their CC1 their mod wheel way too low and then they've got their cc7 their volume or 11 expression like really high to compensate so you hear mm -hmm. it but the problem is you're not hearing like if you're doing if you're doing a flute line for example in that context you're not hearing what would sound like on a stage or in the concert hall you're it's it's as if it's like as if you would be in a concert hall with the orchestra up on the stage playing and then a flute player sitting right next to you mm -hmm. playing really quietly right right and that's that's not the real sound no um the real sound is you putting cc in that context is you putting cc1 pretty much all the way at the top because that will give you the sample from the library mm -hmm of the flute player actually playing the loudest that they can play, which is a totally different sound in terms of the actual frequencies you get. Um, and so, yeah, so in that context, it's like you'd, you'd want CC1 all the way up, and then you'd want CC7 really low even against it mm -hmm. so it sits nicely with everything else because that's how you would get it. Like, if you have 40 strings and then you've got one flute player playing with them, you wouldn't hear the flute above all the strings. For, for those people that maybe are, are listening to this and, think, yeah. and thinking, ah, I've heard this term mock-up several times, and I'm, yeah. I'm not, maybe I'm like in my my second or third year of, of sure. my undergrad, and uh, you know, can you can you give us a little a little dictionary definition of, of what CC controls are? Like, I mean, oh, yeah, they're, sure. they're, they're they're essential to to making it. Sure, sure. But, well, uh, so uh, mock, what, does, what does CC mean, for example? Absolutely. So, um, a mo well, mock-up, first off, just a demo <laughs> mock-up. Anything you're doing that's, you know, in the computer to recreate the orchestra or and it can, be, you, you know, you could call it a elect fully electronic piece of music a mock-up. Um, mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, it's just anything you're doing basically with your computer. Uh, so, yeah, for anyone um, that's sort of just learning the basics... Uh, you know, the sort of universal standard for um, music across all the different um, platforms and pieces of software, everything is MIDI, um, which uh, at its most, most basic sense conveys uh, like the note signal and it'll be the note on and the note off, so the duration. Um, and, uh, but with that note, you can have all sorts of other um, like metadata assigned. Yeah, we'll yeah. call it metadata. Mm -hmm. Sure, that is precisely how you create a mockup, and it's precisely what your sequencer, be it Logic or Pro Tools or Cubase or Digital Performer or um, Reaper or any of those. Mm -hmm. That's what you're communicating to your samples, to your sample library, to trigger the different 
sounds that you can get. And um, there are, I think there's something like 127 different yeah. CC controls. Um, I can't remember, what does CC actually say? It's something control. Yeah, <laughs> I can't remember what it means either. CC stands for something, it's like command control or yeah. something. Um, but it's just a simple way of saying like uh, which... Um, I mean, it's analogous to if you're typing an essay in Microsoft Word um, and you want to emphasize a particular passage, you could make that passage bold or yeah. you could make it italicized. So that is actually very analogous to CC data. CC data is like your, I'm going to make this bold or I'm going to mm -hmm. make it italic. The difference is there's... Technically speaking, there's 127 different options for making it bold or italic. Mm -hmm. You'll never use all of them. I don't know what most of them do. No. The, the key ones, um, the absolute most important ones are um, CC1, which is mod wheel. Any standard like um, digital keyboard will almost always have a mod wheel on the left, mm. um, which will send CC1 values. Um, and most sample libraries utilize CC1 data to um, dictate which dynamic of sample to trigger. Yeah. So I mean, th this is where you would get your, your crescendos from. Exactly. So you would go from... You know, uh, yeah. you get that. So that, what's that really swell. cool, right? So what's really cool about samples these days, right, is um, if, if let's say I'm the company making the sample library to sell to you um, and I'm going to make a French horn library, a French horn solo library. So I get my French horn soloist into the studio and I tell them to play C3 and, I, and sustain it. And what I'm going to have them do is play every single... Um, dynamic level they can play that from pianissimo all the way to triple forte mm -hmm. and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, script it I'm not smart enough for this but they are in a way where different levels of CC1 crossfades yes. between those dynamic values so in effect what I'm now doing is a, I've now given the power over to the Synthestrator, the mock up artist, or composer, whatever you want to call them, to seamlessly use mod wheel and CC1 values in my sequencer to, to create a very realistic sounding crescendo. Yeah. Because I'm not just taking a sample of them playing at a certain level and making that louder. I'm in fact fading between the sample of them playing quiet and the sample yeah. of them playing really loud. And this then goes back to their whole and your point. volume and your volume on the track stays the same. You you're not actually well. No, I mean that that is something that also needs to be fine tuned as well. So there's mm -hmm. CC seven and CC eleven, both of which you can use for most libraries um, to control the actual volume. Mm -hmm. um, and depending on um, what you're trying to achieve, or I mean that's that comes down to mixing, right? So yes. Um, you may need to, you know, if you're making CC1 louder, depending on the sample and depending on what you're doing in the mix, you may need to also play with CC7 uh, to make it louder or in some cases quieter. I've, mm -hmm. I've come across sample libraries where they sort of pre-do that for you. Like, they're, they, as you fade up um, CC1, so as you make, as you trigger the more loud sample, inherent sample, it gets really loud, mm -hmm. um, which is more realistic if you're sort of doing like close mic stuff or you're standing in the room. Yeah. But I mean, if, if, you're, a, if you have a section playing right, as well as a, yeah. player, a soloist. Yeah, but if you're trying to do this in a full mix from a stage or whatever, you, you may in fact need to, as you make CC1 louder, you may need to make CC7 or volume quieter mm -hmm. so that it all feels more... Again, balanced, like, yeah. yeah, balanced, and and again, it all comes down to um, how it sounds. Yeah, you know, it's like there's a, I don't there's some quote out there, right? That chefs say about you can make whatever recipe you want as long as it tastes good. Like, right, you can do whatever you want as long as it sounds real, sounds good. That's all that matters. Um, 
But, uh, yeah, so to bring all this CC talk back to what I was saying before about the flutes, you want to be very aware, right, of your, you've written a passage and you want to now add flutes to it. You, you don't want to put the flutes in with CC1 all the way down and volume all the way up mm -hmm. because what you're going to get is this incredibly unrealistic tone where you're utilizing the samples of the flute playing really quietly, mm -hmm. but you're just having the volume of that be really loud right. against the rest of the orchestra. And that is, that's very unrealistic because if you have a flute playing with the whole orchestra in order to hear them, you're going to want them playing loud. And that's actually the whole reason that CC1 is so important that all this complexity exists is because every instrument sounds vastly different. The same instrument sounds vastly different from when it plays quiet to when it plays mm -hmm. loud. Mm -hmm. And so knowing the subtleties and the nuances of that as well are yeah. like everything in doing a good mock -up. I mean, that, that Microsoft Word uh, comparison analogy is, is perfect. I mean, that would be like... Perfect, but very simplified. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, I mean, it's this idea that instead of you want it in bold because you want it to stand out, yeah. but instead of putting it in bold, you turn it up to, you know, size 120 font against, yeah. against the... Against yeah, the, that's the, a, yeah, the, the that's 30, a the 32, The 32, you know, yeah. text that you, that you have for everything else. So you want it to stay the same, the same size in the font, right. but you want to bold it, and that's, that's what your modulation does. And that that is that's an absolutely fantastic yeah, yeah that's a good uh, way way to too. describe that yeah I didn't even think about that with the font like the font size mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. yeah that's um yeah that's a very good way to think about that so so talk to me about 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 sample libraries themselves yeah so w what's out there and, and where if sure if you're if you're on a budget or you're starting out uh, you've got things like East West and these kind yeah. of, these kind of cloud based based sample libraries so talk to me about those sure um. So, you know, the thing about sample libraries that's a sort of, to me anyways, a universal rule is um, they all have things that are, that are really, that they're really good at and things they're not very mm -hmm. good at. And the key to sort of building up the best possible template um, to achieve the most realistic sound is... Um, again, you have to start by knowing in your head what should something sound like. So you, you build that up that glossary. But once you do that, then you can analytically test out sample libraries and listen and, and realize, pretty quickly realize, okay, yeah, this sample library is really good at this, not so good at that. And, um, and that's when comes sort of this key step of putting them together, like figuring out, like, which sample libraries can you combine to achieve the best sound possible? And the first example I always jump to right away with this is um, there's a, for my string shorts, particularly my violins, um, I, I frequently, very, very frequently, I hear mock-ups that um, don't sound good or right in the violin shorts and it's almost always because they're not given the line that they're trying to write or achieve it doesn't sound short enough it doesn't sound like the real orchestra sitting on the stage yeah. with the players playing that really crisp yeah. short um the only sim sample library i've heard um and mind you i'm not i guess i should say disclaimer i've never been paid by any sample libraries i'm not giving any <laughs> yeah. endorsements or anything like that it's purely out of my own experience the only sample library I've ever heard that really captures violin shorts um, when you really need that really short biting thing is um, the 8DO, uh, it's either the Adagio or Adagietto, I think it's the Adagio, which has a, it's called tapped spiccato and um, as, a, as a key switch. And it um, is just so biting and short. It sounds so great for mm -hmm. those kinds of things. Um, now, on the flip of that, though, is the fact that if you um, if you use only that, you also can suffer because in some cases it sounds, in a lot of cases, actually, it sounds too short. Mm. Um, 
it's got this amazing attack, this really biting shortness that I've never heard anywhere else, but it, it doesn't speak or breathe like a real section would on the stage um, in terms of the very slight millisecond staggerings of attacks and things like that. Um, and so on the flip of that, there's um, LA Scoring Strings, right? They're Spiccato shorts. Um, it's sort of like... I put it's like those to me sound amazing after like a millisecond like the first millisecond of those sounds wrong but then after a millisecond it's got a nice longer richness to the spiccato to the short so um knowing and recognizing right that these two things do the opposite thing well and the opposite thing poorly when you put them together to me, that's the best possible violin short sound I've ever heard. Right. You get the first millisecond of just awesome, crisp attack from the 8 Dio, and then you get a little bit of the extraness underneath it from that extends from the LA scoring strings. Right. And um, to me, that's the best possible violin short sound um, I've heard. And... And in a very general sense, this this goes back to what you're saying, but it, that kind of thing is so important. Like looking at sample libraries and figuring out what each one does really well and poorly and then finding the one that's the flip of that and mm -hmm. complementing them. So right. um, other examples, because I know your, your listeners are looking for really specifics. Um, <laughs> other examples of the same thing I've discovered. Um, uh, Cinebrass has a um, um it's got this like six horns patch legato patch that sounds really great for horns um but there's something about it that to me lacks a bit of realism um and um and something about the way that the legato's work too that also lacks a bit of realism but it has a nice sound what i like to do then is on the flip of that um i discovered not too long ago uh, berlin brass mm -hmm. and um and berlin brass sounds amazing but small that's the it's, that's the arc right the metropolis arc one is that the no 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 uh, orchestra tools or, or, makes yeah it? yeah but the, I think the the name of the of the brass is is, uh, is no that's a different Metropolis, Metropolis Arc, Arc is something actually different oh, okay okay I think I'm pretty sure it's something different this is specifically the Berlin Brass Library um, which I use for a lot of things and I think it sounds amazing in a lot of respects but it also in a lot of places can sound really small um, mm -hmm. I wasn't in love with their French horn. They're four horns together legato. But uh, what is very cool about what they did with that library is they give you... They recorded all four horns at the session. Um, like each of them was a solo. And they did it... So they did it like... You could, you could pick basically any four of the horns mm -hmm. to do as your solo patch, which is to say you get the full legato, the full everything for all four of the horns. Right. So what I did was I put into my template a cool thing where I actually have one MIDI track that activates all four of those patches at the same time. And I have them all returning on the same audio. Okay. And so now I've built my own horns off four patch where I'm actually triggering four different legato like four different midi notes every time and four different legato samples as well and like the legato sounds incredible with right. that but the flip side is is it can sound a little bit soloistic sometimes um when i don't want it to i want it to sound really big so that's when i'll put cinebrass behind it i'll just right. double them up um I'm trying to think. I mean, there's other things like um, Cinebrass has this amazing patch, Monster Low Brass, that I use so much for, you know, big chimbasso, bass trombone, you know, low bombs or or low, you get the low 
if you're trying to double celly bass, big action cue, just the big hit kind of yes. things. Um, the chimba- the chimbasso aspect of that sounds amazing. The bass trombone aspect of that, um, especially on the shorts, doesn't quite sound as realistic. So I'll double that up with my Berlin brass bass trombone staccato, and right. then I get the most real sound. And I, I mean, um, these these libraries are always like they're always bringing out new ones. Yeah, uh, it's it's they're, almost like a, it's almost like a library arms race these days. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you've seen the the Vienna have brought out the new series, the Synchron series. Um, I haven't. They've brought out they've brought out this kind of like they've brought out the full orchestra, and then they brought out chamber. Yeah. smaller versions of them and Spitfire as well uh, for, for those listeners that aren't, aren't sure about these these are all different companies that make different sample libraries that are essentially competing with each other and um, basically the, the tools are that we take the best of each and we combine them yeah. to bring the most realism that we can but I mean um, there are there are so many libraries out there at the minute that, that are fantastic and there's so many uh smaller versions of those grand libraries um that that are you know so if you want that sort of full john williams sound you're yeah going, and then if you want a smaller like the splat sort of sound you're going yeah. to obviously go for like a more chamber-esque sort of sound you know what i mean so and, it is really cool i have to say is i think for a lot of years people were all the libraries and all that were all sort of gravitating towards like bigger and bigger and bigger and let's get like 50 strings and 60 strings and i always felt that a lot of that stuff because it was so big sounded fake Mm -hmm. like if you get there's certain libraries i've heard out there i won't name them but it's like they pack so many string players so many brass players into a room and they record it and when you get like that many players together to me it starts to sound like a synth like you you can't you don't want to do it John Williams or Desplat or Classic Orchestral Q with those kinds of libraries because they just, you get that many players, it doesn't sound more epic, it just sounds more fake, it Mm -hmm. sounds more synthy. So um, what's really cool is in the last couple of years, especially I think a lot of people have sort of asked for and the sample library companies have obliged to like get more detailed and creative about doing smaller sessions. And and I'll admit, I just discovered... um, on my last project, the Spitfire um, chamber strings. Chamber strings, yeah. And did it for, like, all my mock-ups on my last movie were all that. Like, I ditched all my other stuff just for good. And, and admittedly, that movie, too, was much more um, intimate. It was a more intimate score. Um, and, and, in fact, we ended up, we recorded live, but we did it only with 20 strings. Um, and so if anything, the chambers sounded still too big, <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um, for the ultimate sound we wanted and were going for, but, um, but it was, but it's cool. It's cool to see that. It's fun to start using that stuff. Yeah. Um, especially if you want to do less just giant, epic ridiculousness mm-hmm. and more kind of interesting, intimate things. Yeah. But that's, that, that all goes to the point too. Again, it's like, what are you trying to achieve? Yeah. Like which which library will give you your end goal the best and and that comes from just studying masters yeah. and figuring out in your head like this is the sound i want i mean i've i've always kind of uh, adopted into my workflow this idea of taking a a kind of reference piece and you, you take that and drag it in and yeah. have it at the top of the channel so you're always you're always a b and you're always kind of comparing uh you know this is what I'm going for. This is the sound world that I want to kind of occupy. And am I straying yeah. away from that? Am I being led away from that by the samples? <clears> and, <throat> you know, so if you're dragging a cue in and you're saying, oh, okay, I want to go for the Superman sound. Right. So I want that trumpet sitting high above the mix. And yeah. how am I going to, you're always coming back to that. Exactly. Reference. For sure. And, I think w- what you just said, I would say just be careful with that. Because I couldn't agree more with what you just said as it relates to studying how to do the best mock-up possible and the best mix possible. I think where I ran into trouble myself with what you just said in Mm -hmm. younger years was like when my mock-up ended up sounding too similar to the ref. Right. Like, and that's, you know, 
at best, people just accuse you of being unoriginal. At worst, sure. you'll get sued. Like right. so, you know, just be careful if you're if you're working with a ref, as most of us are always doing. Always just be extra mindful mm-hmm. about mm-hmm. not sounding too much like the sure. ref from the writing perspective. But yeah, yeah absolutely. Like if it, the ref is the sonic quality that you want, like get as close to that yeah. as you can because yeah. I mean, it will only lead to a better sounding mock yeah. for sure so I mean you, you kind of touched on a couple of terms there that, that um, some people have asked us to talk about um, one being this idea of key switches and oh, yeah. another idea being mm-hmm. uh, templates those are two terms that you sure. that you used uh, in the that kind of last section uh, sure so tell me what, what are key switches and why are they useful and what is template and why is it useful Okay, I might be the wrong person to ask about key switches because um, I personally hate key switches mm-hmm. with a passion. Me too. Um, I I was forced to use them recently, actually, and it just further reaffirmed my dislike of them. Um, I think it's it's, but for for anyone that doesn't know, key switches are the ability, and a lot of sample libraries give you this ability, or sequencers can give you the ability to essentially with the same MIDI track, you will have a note way down below that you wouldn't actually write for the instrument, or in some cases, maybe way up high, um, where if you hit that MIDI note, it will actually change what your instrument, it like it'll maybe change it to a different patch, or it'll change it to um, a different sort of script or thing within the same patch. Now, the reason that it can be handy or why I think a lot of people like it is you could in theory then have like it instead of basically instead of having one track that's violin long one track that's violin short you just have one track that just violin says violin one Mm -hmm. and now you can use a key switch to within your midi um you know you've got bars one through eight or long and you can use a key switch to say, okay, trigger the long samples. And then you, at bar nine, suddenly the violin starts playing short. You can use a key switch to change to the short sample. Mm-hmm. Um, and it can be cleaner that way. Um, I don't like that uh, for a bunch of reasons. Um, one, it's, in my experience, it's easier to set up a template. And for routing purposes and stem purposes, all of this I'll get to in a sec when I talk about templates. Um, that doesn't involve key switches. It's also easier and faster for me to just m- to just do MIDI on tracks where I want shorts and MIDI on tracks where I want trims yeah. and MIDI on tracks where I want longs, uh, and and then highlight and copy those things if I want to move stuff, if I want to double stuff from my violin shorts to my woodwind shorts. You know, I see the region right there mm-hmm. for shorts. I know exactly what to highlight and grab, and it's yeah. very quick to just move it and copy it into my my woodwind shorts. Mm-hmm. But if it's all in the same track because of key switches, and I'm looking at it from the extent of view, I have got to like go in and look at it carefully to make sure I'm highlighting only the short notes and moving it only up to the short notes up mm-hmm. top and the woodwinds. And it's just, and not to mention, uh, it's just one more thing to do in terms of if I'm writing a long passage, but now I want shorts, instead of just quickly going to my shorts track, I've got to like record the key switch to get ready to play the shorts. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, I just personally don't like key switches, but yeah, I know a lot of people who find them incredibly integral. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, it all, it just depends on your, your workflow. workflow. Yeah. But I mean, let's talk about this idea of templates because templates are, are, the go-to i mean yeah you need them or are you you you're, you're just you so, try to work yeah so templates are um are really important for a couple reasons um first to have an orchestral template that you really like that you really know all the tracks you really know all the samples really well and you know what which track to go to because that's what's for when any passage you're going to write that is what's going to sound best there. Um, it's just all about speed. Like if you're not, it, certainly if you're working on TV, 
but also if you're working on films like and you need to have that demo done by midnight or 7 a.m the next morning like you just you, you don't want to have to worry about building up a new file that has all your orchestra loaded and like everything mm -hmm. like that um you want to be able to just have it, it's it's like the difference between if you're at a scoring stage it's a difference between having the or entire orchestra sitting on the stage ready to play mm -hmm. or, or them get them to walk on or like level. one by one yeah. saying when i need french horn okay french horn can you walk onto the stage now yeah. oh you know i need oboe now like oboe walk onto the stage and mm -hmm. sit down like mm -hmm. that takes time like finding the player finding the right patch mm -hmm. takes time so to just have everyone be sitting right there on the stage ready to go to call up at a moment's notice to play these notes that you want to mm -hmm. write is just really time saving and, and mm -hmm. important um and not just for time but also for quality like knowing your samples knowing what sounds best and being able to call upon that knowledge mm -hmm. is I mean, so important i mean that's not to say that you can't have multiple templates i mean you can oh have, yeah you can have your big template for, for your sure for your bombastic trailers Absolutely. you can have your displot template for your small uh intimate stuff you Absolutely. can have you know um absolutely and but the other thing that's so important that I think a lot of people overlook about templates too um, is um, isn't just the the we'll say the MIDI aspect of it the 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 instrument aspect of it but the mixing mm -hmm. routing aspect of it um, like I know some people who have really wonderful MIDI templates. But they have all their sounds coming back from Vienna uh, Ensemble yeah. Pro or Contact or wherever. For everyone that doesn't know, these are things that just house your samples. Yeah, players. Uh, players, right? So they'll have like all of their sounds and samples that they're hearing coming through one channel, just mm -hmm. going out to their speakers. And that works fine if all you need to do is produce... <clears throat> a single stereo mix but um these days like everyone that you work with wants um stems mm -hmm. at the very least and if you're working on a feature where there's a professional mixer involved um you need to be able to do dry what are called dry synth masters which is essentially like kind of all of your sounds in the orchestra separated out into their own audio files that are perfectly in sync and layered upon one another to add up to your final output. Um, it took me a long time, actually, to learn the significance and importance of this. Um, but once I did, it's like I'm never looking back. It's well, just... Uh, let's just get that... The, yeah. Get that you are bouncing out individual stems, not section stems. So you would give the mix engineer the violin one stem violin two as opposed to the full strings or or would you give yeah. it would, it, would so, it be different from case to case in this in the simplest form there's really two groups of final export we'll call it hmm. there's what we call um like pre-records which are which are also this essentially most of the time not necessarily always but most of the time that's what you pre-records are what you send to the stage if you're recording an orchestra they're also um what the orchestrators will reference mm -hmm. as they're um looking at your midi and listening to your programming and trying to make sure that they put on to the paper what will give you this the best sound that's like what you've done but like pre-records won't be able to hear just all your strings together or just all your brass together right um so there's the pre-records which also if you're not going to the stage at all mm -hmm. if you're just delivering to a to a tv show or a trailer commercial or whatever the pre-records essentially will become your final stems um and typically not on that can differ from case to case it depends on the project it depends on the the um budget. specs the budget the specs of the whatever of your client in terms of whoever's doing your final sound mix the the number of um 
tracks and layers and voices that they can handle will help dictate um, how wide your sort of pre-record batch of stems is. Um, I, I yeah, I, I don't want to confuse anyone, but I lose I use the term pre-records loosely because it it's we'll call it we'll just call that final stems. Right. Final stems, which can be pre-records for the the recording stage. It can be just your final stems if you're not recording at all to the um, anything, client. Anything that's going to be in the movie, essentially, right? Yeah. Um, uh, and it can be the stems that your orchestrators will use to mm -hmm. reference as they do sheet music. Um, so that's your final stems. Typically, uh, and so that can vary from case to case, um, but typically, um, you know, you'll want things like you want that to be more consolidated than the other thing I'm about to get to, which we'll call synth masters. Um, but your final stems, you want, typically you want that to be like as wide as possible, but still consolidated in a way where it's not completely crazy and manageable. So, mm -hmm. you know, maybe all your strings together, all your woodwinds together, all your arpeggiated short synths together, all your big drums together. Um, and this is so your clients or your orchestrators or your... Um, uh, what was the other one? Your mixers. Mixers have... Well, no, that's... No, we're not, not there yet. Not those guys. <laughs> not those guys yet. So your, your clients or... This is so your clients or your orchestrators can have maximum control but also ease to make adjustments if they need to with the music. Um, the other aspect of this, when you're talking about final stems, is they need to be what's called wet, which is built into your stems, into those individual stems, should be all of your EQs, all of your reverb, um, whatever it is, so that when you throw all these audio files into any session, Pro Tools, Digital Performer, whatever it is, and you play them all back with zero dB all at Unity, they together sound exactly like your final, final, final stereo mix, mm -hmm. which we call the reference mix. Um, you want all your, your final stems to add up to your final stereo mix. It took me so long to learn that and get that right. Um, uh, but that's, that's ideally how you want that set up. Now, separate from all of that is something we call synth masters, which is a significantly wider set of stems, which are most often requested to be dry, um, which is to say without reverb. Sometimes without EQ, it depends. That's usually up to your mixer. Now, the only time where this really applies is if you're wearing synth masters and all of what I'm saying now applies is if you're working with a professional scoring mixer, um, because because the whole reason is because you're you want to if you're working with a professional scoring mixer they're gonna have seven thousand dollar hardware reverbs they're gonna have unbelievable yeah. EQs they're gonna have their analog boards be whatever as well. like and so they want to be able to put their amazing touch on it so you want to give them. And, and also because they really know what they're doing and they're geared towards sort of Sign score. Mm -hmm. um, the more separation you can give them, the better. Um, I've never known a scoring mixer to say, give me less separation. Like, the more you can give them, the better. At least in my experience. Um, because then they have maximum flexibility to really make every little aspect of it perfect. Um, and add on their own reverb and add all that. So, so you want to create with your cue as you deliver it. Um, you need to start thinking about, and this is the part of the overarching thing is as you start thinking about templates, you want to start thinking about these two worlds. You want to start thinking about being able to produce final stems, which are wet, uh, with reverb that will go to your clients as the final product or, they will um, uh, go to your orchestrators for their reference mm -hmm. uh, for recording settings. Um, and you also, separate from that, the second world, 
you want to be able to create synth masters, which are your super wide, dry, um, inc um, incredibly separated compilation of stems as well. Um, now, I know plenty of people who um, like their entire job, like their, their literal entire job is just to assist the composer in creating these files when the queue is done. Um, like that's one of the biggest jobs of composer's assistants and is you, you go into the composer studio, the queue is done and you spend hours um, exporting files to create the separation that's required to have both your synth masters, which are all dry, and your pre-records, which are all wet, and they have different levels of consolidation and things like that. Um, I pride myself on, and this is extremely challenging when you're at, when you're setting everything up, but it makes everything really easy in the end. I pride myself on setting up incredibly complicated routed templates so that I can do, in a perfect world, it doesn't always work out like this, but in a perfect world, um, and I encourage anyone to really put the time, to take the time to really try this out if you can. Um, and, and it requires a really good knowledge too about routing mm -hmm. and routing with you in your, um, your sequencer as well as any of your samplers, be it Contact or be Ensemble Pro or East West. But <clears throat> basically what I try to do is set up a template it's certainly for orchestra for all of my projects where um, all of my samples come into digital performer um, completely separate and and dry as certainly dry as they can be from the sample itself and then those get routed into stereo tracks which are just input monitored in Digital Performer. Um, and those stereo tracks become um, my synth masters. Right. So at this point, they're still dry, um, but everything is really separate. So I've got like my um, strings high long, which is violin and viola. Strings high short, violin and viola. Strings low long, um, celli bass. Strings low, short. So that's four tracks right there just for strings. Brass to do the same thing. Woodwinds to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. I've got timpani on its own. I've got piano on its own. Celeste on its own. All these harp on its own. All those things. Totally separate. Because when you when you go to work with a professional scoring mixer, the scoring mixer wants all those things separate. Mm -hmm. um, and... If I every single synth ideally I'll have separate, or if I have two synths that sound really similar and I'm using them for the same thing, then I'll put them together for the synth master. Um, but all of this is coming into stereo tracks, and so when it, um, then from there those are routed through buses to. Um, so this is this is after they go into the the dry track, right? Yes. So then they're getting routed then into the wet. Exactly. So, so they, they go. They go. They so, go. Samples. So so dry, so so right. it goes MIDI. Yeah. My MIDI tracks send MIDI to my samplers. Yes. Vienna, Contact, mm -hmm. it's whatever, Cinebrass, all of it. Mm -hmm. All the sound that comes back from there comes back separately. Nice. Which is the most important thing, right? Mm -hmm. And if you learn about Contact, you learn about VEP. You can do that. You can say, keep, like. This French horn sound, send it back to your sequencer or Cubase or Logic or whatever. Mm -hmm. Send it back separate from this trombone sound, mm -hmm. separate from this clarinet sound. You can have them all come back separately, which is what I do. When they come back into my sequencer, um, it's all separately. They're routed into stereo tracks, which can be record enabled, but they aren't until the very, very end. Um, but they're routed into stereo tracks, and they're dry at this point. From there, they get routed to aux tracks in a more consolidated fashion. So now my four separate string tracks, which are s existing separately at this point, they all get sent through a bus 
and consolidated into just strings. Mm -hmm. And on that is an aux track where I'm adding reverb, I'm adding EQ if I need to. Mm -hmm. Um, and that gets sent to a stereo track that is my strings pre-record or my strings sure. final stem, if you, whatever you want to call it. And now, and like same thing with brass, same thing with woodwinds. So my four tracks that are dry now get sent to a wet, reverberant, singular brass track, singular woodwind track, singular percussion track, etc. And then at the very end, those tracks are all sent <clears throat> to one final stereo track, which is just a stereo master. mix of the yeah. whole thing, a stereo master of the whole thing, right? What's really cool about this, it is a major pain to set up. It gives you a big <laughs> headache, but I really cannot say how worth it is because yeah. I, what's really cool about this is um, once you have it set up that way and in, in this great template, um, if you have if you're working for someone and they say, Evan, I need all your synth masters on this six minute queue. I need all your pre-records. Uh, I need all your synth masters for the mixer. I need all your pre-records for the orchestrators in the dub stage. Um, and I need your two mix, your reference mm -hmm. for all of it. I need it by like tonight. Instead of being like, oh crap, this is going to take me seven hours to do each little thing separately in one... Like, literally all I have to do is record enable these stereo tracks, mm -hmm. and in one single real-time pass, I print yeah. something like 45 tracks. That's, like, just hyper-efficiency. It's just amazing. If it, that's how I did... So my last feature, I didn't... Like, I didn't have the budget to have, like, an assistant come in and do synth masters for me, or pre-records for mm -hmm. me. So, um, this really saved me, because I was able to do... On like eighty minutes of music with this template, I was able to do all the synth masters and pre-records in like a day. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so your templates are super, super valuable. I mean, in terms so of so valuable for time, for time saving. saving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the any any really legitimate project. Uh, I'll just say, like any legitimate project these days, um, will at the very least ask you for final steps. Mm -hmm. A lot of projects won't ask you for synth masters because you also won't have the budget to hire a scoring mixer. Mm -hmm. um, but any legitimate project will ask you for final stems. Final stems, yeah. So that, at the very least, is is the most important mm -hmm. thing. I mean, just on a, on a on a kind of devil's advocate type thing, there are some perceived uh, cons or negatives to the templates, and that is in the the kind of composition aspect of it, not the, not the the technical, um, the kind of the technical ability that it, that it provides you. But I mean, if you're if you're just double clicking and you're pulling up the same template every single time, mm -hmm. using the same samples that you've mm -hmm. that you've, you tend to develop a or each project, unless you develop a new template for each each project, you know, yeah. uh, you tend to default. You tend to uh, oh, okay, so I'm going back to my same spiccato strings and I, I know exactly what they're like, so I'm going to write the same sort of passage that I wrote last time. And Whereas if you're Alan Silvestri or you're always thinking about the music rather than the player, you know what I mean? Um, I've, I've heard that sort yeah. of... I've heard that argument come across uh, where your, your sound can become quite uh, repetitive, I, I suppose is the word, from project to project where you're... you're um, I mean, I mean th sure. th that is one criticism of that, I, yeah. that, that, that I've heard. I, like, I mean, the, 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 the positives far outweigh the benefits, but I mean, that, that is one sure. criticism that I've heard. I, no, I hear that. I think that's one reason, too, why it's so important to... Um, to know your samples and know what the orchestra sounds like, I suppose. That, but also, what I was going to say is why it's really important to um, sort of be constantly pushing yourself to try new things mm -hmm, and mm -hmm, to try... Experiment, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'll say this. I don't... Like, until I hear a better spiccato patch, like, I won't change yeah. the one in my template. Sure. Because I don't think I should, because one of my templates sounds really good. And I don't think it locks me into always having this aim. I think it keeps me aware. But but that doesn't say I'm not open to 
mm-hmm. newer patches or newer things. I mean, the other thing too is that every project is different. And the last the last movie I did, um, uh, shameless plug. It's called A Violent Separation. It's a really awesome film, and I don't know yet what the distribution plans are for it. But um, that was a much more. Um, it's sort of a. Uh, heartland americana drama thriller Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so like purposefully nothing in that score could sound like a big symphony orchestra it all had to sound like really intimate things so like i had my template but like i i never once used my typical spiccato patch i used um like that's when I challenged myself to go get the Spitfire chamber groove, right, right, because um, mm-hmm. it sounded more real for what I needed. Or like I even used solo patches mm-hmm. like a lot, um, mocking that up. Yeah, I mean one of the things that I'm, I'm kind of trying to incorporate is this idea of the hybrid score, which mm-hmm. I suppose is that Hans takes that again to the extreme coming coming back, um, and it's this idea of of if you have no budget, if you're working, you know, from from scratch with really nothing no help just you in a room yeah you know and you have friends and you have musicians it's like so okay so you've got this lovely string line and you've you've got the the john williams orchestration where you've got your your horns combined with your celly or whatever and you go ah man you know i would really love or what would really work here is if i had one horn recorded live Mm. and Mm -hmm. i just then blend that in with the samples yeah and that that creates this sort of like it gives you that realism and it's it's a a, a kind of a cheat almost to sure. for 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 your your super super like if you're on zero and you're calling in favors from friends and, and that yeah that, that is that is a really legitimate way to to achieve that realism in your in your mock-ups as well it is it's in my experience you have to be careful with that what you what you just described is what the actual term for that that we all call that is sweetening. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We call it sample sweetening. So it's when you have a something that's purely mock-up, purely digital on your computer, and then you get a live player or two mm-hmm. to literally like dub over yes. your samples to give it like a little bit of that live element. Um, the thing about sweetening is it it's like... It's it's a mixed bag because it if you don't you have to be really careful with it in my experience. I, I did a cue a couple years ago that was like a really big um sort of orchestral John Williamsy type thing. And I remember I sweetened it and um I was never really I don't wanna say I wish I hadn't sweetened it, because it's like in the end I probably it was probably still the right move. But it also, I've never loved that master. I've never mm-hmm. loved how it came out. There are things about it that, like, you know, moments where the horns come in, where it's, like, all as I listen to it, all I can hear is, like, my one horn player yeah. that sweetened it, right. you know? Um, and uh, it, it, all I'm saying is, I guess, it, in my experience, it never quite sounds like how you want it to. Right. Um, if you're really low on funds... Um, it's, it's probably the best action, but I, I'd encourage everyone to really think about, just think about it. I don't, I don't, I, mm-hmm. I, I'm just, mm-hmm. I'm still torn on sweetening. Okay. It's interesting because it's something that I've been, I've been playing <clears throat> with a lot. Yeah. And not to be confused with, if you've got like, I'm, I, I, I actually, I should really make a distinction because I'm not saying... If you write something in a mock-up, but then you have, like, an oboe solo Mm -hmm. or a French Mm -hmm. horn solo. Sure. Like, oh, yeah, for sure, 100% doing that live will make all the difference in the world. Mm -hmm. What I'm talking about that I'm not sold on is if you're actually trying to double up sectional stuff. Like, if if you've got a big, excuse me, a big string section and you want a big sweeping... 12 violin, 16 violin sound on a melody Mm -hmm. and you want it to sound more real so you add one violin dubbed two or three times mixed in with it. 
I've I've all I'm saying is that is where I've had like very mixed results where yeah. it wasn't fully sold. I mean, you you do have problems of uh, tuning or intonation or timing. I mean, yeah. you also you, just hear like you just I just feel like you just hear yeah the just solo like the, player. Just like there's one violin there. Yeah, there's just like no way not to hear the solo player um, mm-hmm. unless you're like the best mixer ever, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and then. And you just mix it really low. I mean, I remember yeah. too. I, when I did this project I was talking about, I was I was working with a, a, a professional scoring mixer who does a lot of my stuff, and I just kept him. I just kept telling him to turn down the overdubs. the sweetened yeah. overdubs. Yeah, because mm-hmm. it just sounded like it was, like it's like yeah, it's more real sounding, but it's also just it sounds like one player. Yeah, like, and yeah. this needed to sound like a huge orchestra. Sure. Um, so it's a very mixed bag, but yeah, yeah, to be very clear, I'm not talking about yeah. when you're doing a solo passage. Yeah, yeah, solo, definitely try and get a solo as oh, they come yeah. in and play Always. those parts. Yeah, yeah. Always. Yeah. Okay, uh, I know we've got, we have, we're kind of running short on time here, yeah. so is there anything else that, uh, you know, you, you would say is super important to, like, the, the purpose of this kind of podcast is not mm. necessarily to, to explain concepts in depth, it's more to just inform people yeah. that these things exist or these this world exists in in and the, the the skill level that it takes to convince somebody yeah that i i actually uh i, I my last podcast was was with christopher young and i and i asked him i said you know have, have you ever heard because he's, he's he's of the old school right he's he's kind of that sort of uh jerry goldsmith john williams uh you know yeah. i was like have you ever heard a mock-up that has fooled you and he, he thought about it for a moment, you know, and he took it, he paused and he said, you know what? No, I've never, ever, ever been fooled by an orchestra, by a mocked up orchestra. Mm. He says, but the only reason is, is because I've spent my entire life working with real ones. Right. And, yeah. and from, from, from his student days, I mean, he was, he was cobbling together just scratch ensembles with, with his friends and things, but his entire career has been in John Williams, I'm sure He's never. The, I think the reason John Williams doesn't use mock-ups is because he would hate all of them. He would be like, "That's not what it sounds like. That's not what it sounds like." You know what I mean? You, you couldn't yeah. fool him. That he doesn't need to. And he but doesn't yeah. need to. But I mean, it would infuriate him. I imagine. Yeah. I imagine he would be. He would be like, "That. That. That's not what it sounds like." Right. Um. I mean, it's probably true. Because he. I mean, give a mock-up to uh, uh, Daniel Baraboim or or uh, you know uh, Gergiev or somebody. You know, I mean, he's like, "What's that? That's that's not an orchestra." But I mean. The the challenge of a of a of a of a mock up artist is not to fool John Williams, is not to fool Christopher Young. It's to not to fool anybody, it's to convince. Yeah. It's to convince people, not not those people, but your average listener. The the guy that's shooting into the walking dead on a Monday night, the guy that's your client. Oh your your client, yeah. Your or, client. Who your client and their clients. Yeah. So your client is the the producers yeah. and the director of the thing you're working on. Yeah. And their clients are the people they're work mm-hmm. they're marketing it towards, yeah. whether it's a show or a movie or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or sometimes it's not even it's not even to say that that this is trying to be an orchestra. Right. I mean, Junkie XL would never right. yeah. ever ever say that exactly. this is trying to be an orchestra. This is trying to be what it is, right. and it just uh, happens to use the orchestra in that yes, way. You know exactly. what I mean? So just to, to finish off, and and you know, I'm, I'm I know that you're that you're really short on time, so. Uh, is there any sort of terminologies or any elements that we haven't really touched on that you think are are important for people to know about? I mean, what about like physically playing things in as opposed to drawing them in? That's a very kind of personal choice, I think, for everyone. Um, I People, whenever they come into my studio, and I know we're not doing video so no one can see, but I'll describe it. People are always very surprised to see my studio is a bit unique in that I have my keyboard off to the left mm-hmm. as kind of a literal side thought. Right. So you have um, to actually turn in your so chair. So I have to, to actually move my chair a couple inches back to the left and turn to play anything on my keyboard. And the reason is because um, like I, I've worked in other people's studios where they've got the keyboard on the desk in mm-hmm. front or kind of right at their knees and like 
first and foremost, you can't, when that's the case, you can't be comfortable when you're sitting. you got to be, like, really kind of uptight, rigid, and reaching far. And, mm-hmm. um, and when you're doing this for many, many hours of time, that's, that's like, sucks on your back and your neck. And mm-hmm. um, I want to be able to really scooch into my desk and get close and kind of recline, actually, as I work. Um, just so I can be really relaxed and comfortable. And it can't do that with my keyboard blocking my knees. Um, but the other thing about it is, personally, it's like, I just realized, for me, I spent so much more time manipulating MIDI notes, manipulating CC programming on the screen than I did playing stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's like once I've got MIDI notes there, like, I... I can copy and paste. I can do it all on the screen with my mouse and keyboard. Um, so, uh, but someone else who really plays everything in um, wouldn't like that. Like, wouldn't yeah. want to work like that. Mm-hmm. I think that's an entirely personal stylistic choice. It just yeah. depends on what you do better. I mean, also, I'm just, I I played piano for many years, but I just, I still, I wouldn't consider myself that great of a piano mm-hmm. player. So, I'm, I can be much more precise and, Sure. Fine tune everything just with my mouse and keyboard on the screen. Um, I'm trying to think about other stuff though that I really value in terms of stuff I've learned that I may have left out. Um, I can't think of anything specifically that I've left out, but I guess I would say to sort of sum up, I, I could just not over ever over uh, stress the importance of spend as much time as you can teaching yourself how things should sound yeah because it will make all the difference in the world when it comes to doing your own mock-ups and doing your own mixes and realizing oh you know this woodwind line that i'm writing here with a real orchestra it wouldn't be that loud against the strings playing like Mm this Mm -hmm. um the strings wouldn't be that loud playing against the brass playing like this um you know Oh, this line sounds great, but you know it would sound even better if the timpani was playing it too. Um, or this line sounds great, but um, it would sound even better if the cello and bass were playing with the tuba and mm-hmm. trombones and octave and octaves with it. Like, mm-hmm. um, and it's just learning all those lessons, like learning all those things. Um, is just so important and then also the the what we talked about earlier about the next level of that was specifically samples and knowing oh you know this spiccato sounds great but it sounds better if yeah. it sounded a bit longer so let me add a longer sample behind sure. it um i mean it's like the pyramid right you've got your foundation and that is the exactly. the real world orchestra and then your second tier is yeah. is getting as accurate a representation yeah. of that yeah. and then above that then is you're trying to replicate the actual playing technique right and then above that is your final touches to make it sound coherent and together and yeah i mean yeah. It, it is a hierarchy but from the bottom up yeah. rather than from the top down the other big thing which we didn't touch on specifically but the other huge thing about samples allowing you to cheat mm-hmm. is um you can write like most sample libraries will give you the ability to have a, like with trumpets, for example, um, or actually let's say with horns, for example, they'll give you the ability to play up to E4 mm-hmm. or F4 even maybe. Um, but like, you pretty much almost never want to write that yeah. down. I mean, it's like, like, and the same can be said for trumpets playing up to I don't even know what, but like, yeah. or or like or like, uh, and if you do write that note, make sure it isn't sustained for yeah. three bars, like, and that the rest of the whole piece is really yeah. lower and easy because, like, samples allow you to cheat because you don't have to take into account. Certainly you don't have to take into account breathing, but you also don't have to take into account exhaustion or chops. Mm-hmm. It goes mm-hmm. back to the thing I said about the cello ostinato I wrote in college that never ended, never gave anyone a rest. Um, so again, if you can learn about, um, if you can really sort of study Williams and Silvestri and the greats mm-hmm. and just learn about like what's possible. Yeah. like what's, And if you have any questions too, here's another thing I'll say. Get yourself an orchestrator friend. Mm-hmm. Like... Make friends, in my experience, most of the orchestrators, especially in L.A., are really awesome, nice people. Yeah, yeah um, they are. 
I can't speak enough about some of the guys I've gotten to know. Um, two of my favorites are right off the top of my head are David Crystal, who I actually, um, who uh, I met through the University of Miami because he graduated from there. And I gave him one of his first orchestration gigs on one of my features, Martyrs, years ago. And then he graduated to working for Ben Walfish on mm-hmm. Hidden Figures and Cure for Wellness and It, and he's mm-hmm. just crushing it. And um, mm-hmm. and then another guy I met through the ASCAP workshop, Andrew Kinney, who uh, yeah. is just amazing. He's done, he just did, like, solo. And, yeah, um, yeah, nice. And, and, but, like, these are guys who, if, and there's all the, like, I, I like to think I know a fair amount about this stuff, but there's also so much I don't yeah. know. I mean, um, it's specialization, and that's why that, yeah. that term and exists. And being able to right? just, like, email David or Andrew or call them up and be like, guys, I'm trying to write this thing. Is this going to be okay? Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. does this even sound right? Um, and have them say, yeah, oh, this is going to sound awesome. Yeah, like, yeah. here, like, when Andrew Kinney tells me, yeah, this will sound awesome, I have this new level of, like, excitement and confidence yeah. over this thing I've written. Yeah, because then you know? you're excited to hear it being actually yeah, played. Yeah, because then it, you know, like, okay, all right, this will work, you yeah. know? Um, I mean, go, and, going back to, like, knowing the limitations of the software uh, yeah. in terms of replicating the actual what's going to appear on stage is, like, knowing that if you write a piccolo way up high at pianissimo, that is going to be essentially impossible for a player to play because they're going to have to really breathe hard to get up well, there. Well, I just don't think there's such a thing as yeah, piccolo at pianissimo. But I mean, like, high. yeah, but you can just pull that down. Yeah, the mix, true. Um, yes. Which, which you're, you're, that's right. you're getting, you're getting... You could, yeah, that's right. You could put CC7 volume so low that it would be barely audible. Yeah, but, but I mean, the reality that's is, always going to cut through, right? Exactly. The reality is if you have a piccolo playing up high... You're going to hear it. You're going to hear it. Yeah. Like, guaranteed to hear it. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, but just one last thing that's, that's come into my mind before we before we wrap sure. up. Sure. It's this idea of these acoustic replicators. So you've got, like, the Pro has Mir, and you have, um, what's the other one, Virtual Sound Stage, I think is the one. Okay. It's these, these plugins that replicate... Um, uh, spaces so they're they're essentially reverbs but but okay. kind of more positional reverbs where you can actually get in and place your your track or your your sample your instrument mm. within the space um so mir mir is the big one m i r by mm-hmm. by by v e pro and um so essentially a mixer yeah as far as i could tell would pan things in the stereo, right? So you you would pan your tracks in the mixer according to where they would be in the orchestra, right? Yes, I mean a lot of sample libraries though. Yeah, are already come panned, right? pre-built mm-hmm. to have the player sitting in yeah. sort of the right spot. Um, yeah, but anyways, yeah, go on. So I mean, I mean, it's it's a, it's a strange one because you, you can that that concept can be a massive mistake. I mean, yeah. you can use these plugins like Mirror or Virtual Sound Stage and you can place the the objects in a space, uh, you know, and you can position them relative to each other. Yeah. And you can position them relative so that the reflections are coming in a particular way. And you can get real... Mirror is extremely complex. Like, the engineers are, like, ridiculous. Um, mm. And you can, you can put them as related to the audience or related to the conductor or whoever it is that you're that from the point of view of the listener um and you can you can change uh reverb uh like timings so that the timings are different it's super super complex wow. uh but then if you're going in and you're adding reverb on top of that yeah in the plugins on the on the, on the tracks right and then you're panning on top of that and then you have the actual placement of the sample itself I mean, that can be just saturation and, mm. and become far too much for the mix. So, I mean, um, being aware of of the problems that can arise from the software is also yeah. something, but that comes with making mistakes. And True. Um, what well, comes with testing it? I mean, so, okay, that's another thing I, I'll say. Um, anytime I get a new sample library, I spend a day at least, like, literally just getting to know it mm-hmm. it sounds silly it's like your buddy you're taking out for a beer you're getting to know but like literally i will spend a day at least if not two or three 
just playing with the patches, trying to mock up different passages of famous things I know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. be it Superman or anything else. Uh, when I got Berlin Brass, I spent two days just mocking up different parts of Star Wars. Right. Um, and, uh, and, and, and But what you're saying, the part about saturation and reverb, all that, that can also come from just like getting to know your samples. Like sure. Learning about what your samples, goes back to my point about like what your samples do well, what they mm-hmm. don't do well. The other thing I'll say is, I mean, what you're talking about with Mirror and all that, it does sound cool. I've never used any of that. Okay. Actually. Um, and I rarely tweak panning on mm-hmm. my samples too. Most of the time I'm pretty happy with like where things are sitting spatially right out of the box. Okay. Um, but if I'm not, that's part mm-hmm. of the getting to know your samples so, process and I will make adjustments if I have to. If I need, so my reverb that I use though, I don't use me or any of that, but I do, I use, um, and a lot of people are always like amazed by this. Um, I consider it a funny point of pride, but <laughs> like I don't use any $7,000 Burkashti reverbs and that's not a knock on those mm-hmm. them or anyone who uses it either. Altiverb or, or something Altiverb like that. Or Altiverb or yeah, Lexicon yeah. or any of that. Um, one of the reasons I actually really like Digital Performer is because I really like their just built in comes with it mm-hmm. um, for free and and also uses very little CPU power. Right. Um, it's called Proverb and it's their convolution reverb plugin built mm-hmm. in the um, that you can load on any channel, and I think it sounds fantastic. I yeah. use it for like all my models. I mean, one one of the one of the best one of the best analogies, and and it basically summarizes that up is just it, it comes back to just knowing how to get the most out of your gear, and right. if, if if you know how to get the most out of your your stock plugins, right, then that's infinitely better than <laughs> buying the most expensive plugin in the world and not having a clue how to use it. I mean, yeah. you could have the entire Waves, you know, platinum so package true. or whatever. And <laughs> you, you could what? buy a two octa-core yeah. UAD, UAD modules. UAD stuff, yeah. But I mean, I mean... Uh, for $7,000. The best, the, the best, well, the best... Again, thing. no knock on UAD or anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're fun, just fantastic. But I mean, you have to know how to use it. The best analogy would be if you were betting on a race between me and a... Sorry, no, me and a Ferrari... And like Mario Andretti in a Mustang, mm-hmm. like you would take Mario Andretti in the Mustang every single time yeah. if you were a smart person. Like only a dumb person would bet on me. Like not, you know, I'm not yeah. a bad driver, but like I'm not a freaking multi-awarded, brilliant yeah. race driver, professional race driver. Like it doesn't matter what what I'm driving. Like it doesn't matter yeah. how fast of a car I'm driving. Like, you wouldn't bet on me against someone who spent in a slower, cheaper car that, like, really knows what they're doing. Yeah. 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 yeah I mean, but it, again, like, that, that idea, and that, that's something that I've witnessed a lot, is this idea that, that, and it's not a bad thing, it's the idea that your compositions are informed by or, or influenced by the sounds that you're using, you know, yeah. say, oh, this sounds great, so I'm going to do more of that. True. You know, that that's that's super important, and and that, that's a that's part of the process, and part, if that's how you compose, then then there's nothing wrong with that. But where it gets to be a problem is where your your compositions sound fake, or they sound they they lose realism because the, your compositional processes have been informed to the point where you know you're losing authenticity um mm-hmm. you know what i mean again junkie xl or these people you know they definitely would would argue that point and say well it's part of the art it's part of the process but it really depends on what you're selling you know what i mean if, if you're selling john williams yeah that that sounds yes. like junkie xl yes then you're definitely absolutely true. you're definitely all you've must have you've must have mark there true but if you're selling junkie xl it sounds like junkie xl then right. you've, you've nailed it um well you've touched on another interesting point which is i think there's a lot of people especially when I was first coming out here and first starting out, there was a lot of people I remember who said, like, never, ever, ever let your samples tell you what to write. Mm -hmm. Like, never let them, never write just for your samples, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think, I've been thinking a lot about that recently, actually, because I don't know that's always necessarily fully true. No, I don't think so. I think if you're trying to do, like you say, a John Williams-type sound, that's true. Mm -hmm. Um... But I think that 
there's something to be said for leaving room for the way that samples can inspire you, yeah. especially more nuanced libraries. There's mm -hmm. there's one library I got um, from Spitfire that's great too, the Olafur Arnold's mm -hmm. uh, Chamber Evo, right? Which is a lot of like really cool, interesting um, kind of chamber string like textures, mm -hmm. like. Um, different kind of trims and bends and things like that. It's very hard to describe, but it's more aleatorics kind of not stuff. Not even aleatoric. It's more like um, I don't know how to put it. Like pads. Right. Like it's 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 um, it's just a really cool way to approach drones. Okay, but like in a way that's very organic and. Um, it's like if you would, you know what it's like? It's like if you opened Omnisphere and you wanted tonal pads. Mm, okay. Mm -hmm. It's that, but for s chamber strings. Okay. Which is really cool because it gives you the ability to do these amazingly intricate and interesting pads and drones, which is really useful in a lot of scoring mm -hmm. these days. Mm -hmm. um, but not have it sound electronic. Right. Have it sound really earthy and authentic and organic because it's strings. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I used it all over my last score. Um, and it's, it's, um, but all, all, I'm, all I bring it up is because it, it is inspiring. Mm -hmm. It is inspiring. It is inspiring and it is fun to play with those things. Now, I mean, I mean, I the think... danger becomes if you make it just that. And then unfortunately too, you're stuck with something that sounds like too many other things because they all have that sample library too. Mm -hmm. But I think if you're using it as a place of being inspired and then you're building upon it, I yeah. think it's a great... It's a great tool. Have you seen Spitfire's Lab? Do you know you know about that project? They've got this thing called Lab. Um, Is that the one that has the swarm? It might could be. It, it's free. I heard about it. It's 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 Spitfire and it's free, but it's basically it's an open it's an open platform as far as I know. Um, for any anybody that's uh, that's building sample libraries mm -hmm. um, and if they're experimenting in any way. Um, then you can submit it to, to Spitfire's lab, yeah, lab yeah. laboratory, and it's all free, downloadable stuff. Uh, cool. so, and I mean, yeah, it, you're you can totally be inspired by by a new patch or something. You just play cool. something. It's like, ah, okay, maybe if I take that a little bit further, or um, you know, if I apply, you know, reverb or a bit of delay or whatever it is, yeah, and all of a sudden your your composition moves into something new or it becomes something else. Um, but I mean, again, it, it really comes back to this idea of what am I selling? What, yeah. am, I, what am I trying to get? Know what here? your end goal is exactly. And, and but uh, I mean, thank you so much for yeah, uh, for, for taking the time and, and having this a fantastic conversation. Really, there's a lot of ideas, a lot of new things that I that I hadn't heard of before, and uh, things to think about, like these templates ideas and this routing idea is super super important. You'll hate yourself. <laughs> when you're trying to set up such a complex template, but when it comes time to export and print, yeah. you'll be so happy. I mean, uh, so basically, what, what uh, if there's anywhere that um, people can find you online or, yeah. you know, sure. the, the best things. place, which also has contact information on it, is my website, mm -hmm. which is just um, www.evangoldmanmusic.com. Mm -hmm. That's E V A N G O L D M A N, uh, music. Mm -hmm. And that's got all sorts of sample. I need to update it um, mm -hmm. with some newer stuff, but it's got all sorts of good um, information and and um, mm -hmm. sort of samples of my work, and then also um, uh, contact information. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, Evan. Thanks yeah. so much. Thank you so much. I'll chat to you soon. Appreciate it.